happy Palm Sunday, everyone. This is uh, the day that marks our, uh, the beginning of our coming into the Easter season, uh, which begins today and, and takes us through what's called Holy Week and into uh, Easter Sunday, which is a week from today. So just encourage you guys, um, we've emailed out um, and posted, I believe, in our band app, um, uh, the PDF document to for our Holy Week devotionals. It's going to help you to be able to walk your family. It's about a 10 to 15 minute thing each day to walk your family through Holy Week, um, whether 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 it's you by yourself or you with a, a group of others in your household. I really encourage you to do that. If you um, don't have access to that, talk to uh, uh, talk to one anybody that you've seen up front, um, and we'll get you plugged into that. Um, you know, just as Vincent was praying through the pastoral prayer, I, I'm, I'm reflecting on the state of the world. And it's interesting because on one hand, um, I'm hearing that, uh, you know, war between Russia and the Ukraine um, is this horrible thing that's broken out and it's this uh, extreme violent act in our day. And, and then at the same time, I'm remembering that the war in Ukraine is very public to us because it affects us politically and economically, but that it's only one of more horrific w wars that's being fought around the planet. Um, so many others that are taking even more lives um, and yet that we don't think about on a daily basis. Um, and I reflect and I think on one hand, how much worse is the world than we even realize? And on the other hand, I wonder if the world is any worse than it ever has been. We have a saying that everything is going to hell in a handbasket. And it's this idea that the world is getting progressively worse, that, that as time goes on, the world is getting progressively worse. And, and it's coming up to this, this pinnacle of destruction that's maybe at some unknown day in the future. And I'm just not sure that's actually the way that it is. Because even as I reflect on my life and my my biggest at least social and political complaints have to do with like gas prices and things like that and inflation and if I go to other places in the world there's people that are fighting for their very lives on a daily basis and as I look at history and uh, even even biblical history going back throughout um, time that's that's actually the norm for most cultures historically is is that every day is a fight for survival. And sometimes it's a, it's a fight for survival because of famine and because of hunger. And sometimes it's a fight for survival because you're warring with neighboring nations. And, but it's a fight for survival that goes all the way back to the beginning when sin entered the world. And so that even if we go back about as far as we can go in biblical history, 4,000 years ago, there was a man who lived. His name was Abraham. And... In Abraham's day, he lived in that type of culture where, where death was a possibility any day of your life, either because of famine or because of violence. Let's talk about Abraham. Abraham's a, it, it'd be an understatement to say that Abraham is an important biblical figure. That would be an understatement. Abraham lived 4,000 years ago. He, he was from, the, from uh, a, a tribal nation in the Valley of Haran. And uh, that's an interesting detail because historically what we can derive from that is that Abraham was not a follower of God, the God of the Bible. He wasn't a follower of the Almighty at this time. Abraham was what we might call a pagan. He, he lived in a land where they worshipped uh, gods who are not God. They worshipped uh, um, they, they worshiped idols. Um, and it was out of this context that the Lord, Yahweh, the God of the Bible, the Almighty, called Abraham uh, into a great calling. Now, Abraham was old. He was very, very old. He was married uh, to his wife, Sarah, and they had no children. They weren't able to bear children. And we're told in the story that Sarah is way beyond her years of being capable of bearing children. So this whole idea of the promise that we'll get to in a minute that God made to Abraham is, is kind, of, kind of insane. 
And yet God comes to Abraham and he calls him and he says, I want you to take your wife and your servants. They had some servants and some animals and stuff. And I want you to leave your family. Remember, this is an old, old man. An old, old man. I want, and he, wa- he wants him to leave the safety of his tribal community and go out into the wilderness among people who his people are at war with. Right? We don't send 100-year-old men into war. Right? That's... You know, but that's what God wants to do. He wants him to go out, and he wants him to go into another land and claim that land uh, for God's people. And so he leaves the, the gods of his people. He leaves his false gods, and he begins to set his eyes on the Almighty, the God of the Bible. And so he goes out, him and his wife and his handful of servants and their animals, and they start to, to put up tents in the wilderness as they go towards the land of Canaan, this land that the Lord promises to Abraham the promise was interesting it was about a five-fold promise maybe a fourfold the promise was first of all to receive a land the Lord took Abraham up on the high mountains and he pointed to him the boundaries of all of the land that he would promise to him that he had that he would give to Abraham's descendants further he promised that he would bless Abraham and give him many many descendants and that's and that's crazy this word descendants was like very confusing to Abraham and Sarah because they were already past child rearing age and they they weren't they didn't have any children yet they weren't able to have children and so this whole idea of descendants was very confusing to the point that even at one point Abraham's like well I sort of have an inheritance through my brother's nephews you know whatever like right like I have an inheritance from the guy who I got this dog from or something like that. Like really loose connection to some other family member that Abraham intends to, when he dies, give all of his property over to. And, uh, and yet God is like, no, actually, I have a greater promise to you. I will give you a son to inherit this promise of the land and of the people, all of the descendants. And in fact, The Lord told Abraham that his descendants would be as countless as the stars in the sky and as countless as the grains of sand in the sea. And and that's 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 crazy. What he's saying is that you have so many, so many descendants that will be impossible to number them. And so Abraham's like, okay, let's do it. So he obeys the Lord. He packs up. He goes out to the land of Canaan and he walks faithfully with the Lord. Now, he's not a perfect man. He does, he's, he's, he's still sinful. He makes mistakes. But in everything, he has his eyes set on the promise that God, that God had given to him. And, he tells, and, and so the Lord tells Abraham that because of his obedience, he will count him as righteous. So Abraham becomes the first uh, one who is, in a sense, a father of righteousness. He's restored Uh, to God and to his kingdom. And so then Abraham becomes a key figure in Israel, the nation of Israel that would come out of Abraham's descendants because he is the first one. He's the father of righteousness. And so they, they call him the father even of Israel. And then Abraham remains a key figure in the church today. That, that even as Christians and, and of no Jewish blood in me, I still consider myself a child of Abraham, as does every Christian biblically. And why is that? Well, we're going to get to it, but let's look at the author of Hebrews. He's going to reflect on Abraham's story and give us some insight into why Abraham, and more so the promises that the Lord made to him, Abraham, are so important. Let's, let's look at Hebrews 6, verses 13 and 14. He writes, for example, there was God's promise to Abraham. Since there was no one greater to swear by, God took an oath in his own name saying, I will certainly bless you and I will multiply your descendants between, beyond number. So he's reflecting on the story. We already talked about this, that the Lord promised to bless him and multiply his descendants. I want you to think about this word multiply. D- does that word multiply create any connections in the scripture for anyone? Where where did you first, when you read the Bible, where did you first hear the word multiply? That's right, be fruitful and multiply. This is the command that the Lord gave to Adam all the way in the very beginning of time. 
In the beginning of creation, the Lord created the man, and he said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. This was always the purpose. And in fact, I've talked about this before, but, but when we're thinking about the Bible as a whole, it's 66 separate books from uh, 37, I believe, different authors. And yet, there's one coherent story of the Bible. And if I were to take all 66 of these books and w try to write a caption for what the Bible is about, try to synopsize it down into one little sentence, I would say this, that the Bible is about this, that God is building a kingdom for his glory. That, that's the, that should be the caption on the, front, uh, on the front of every Bible. Holy Bible, you know, like CSB or ESV or whatever you're reading, God is building a kingdom for his glory. That should be the subtitle for the Bible. Because that's what it is. Because the very first command given to humankind was multiply and fill the earth. God was always about the people. Bringing together the people in the land under a king that is God. And of course, humankind didn't do things the way they were supposed to. They didn't acknowledge God as king and set themselves up by king. That's what the deceit of the serpent is in the garden. And the whole worth world literally begins to fall apart until we get to the flood. And the Lord floods the earth and saves righteous Noah. And when Noah and his, and his sons and uh, his son's wives and his wife, and they come, out of the, they come out of the ark, the Lord gave the same command to Noah. Multiply and fill the earth. Multiply and fill the earth. And again, they begin to multiply. And when people started to cover the land, then again, they began to gather at the Tower of Babel to, to create a name for themselves in place of the name of the one true God. And this is the birth of the nations. And so the Lord separated the nations and he sent them all over the earth. And the very next story is Abraham. Where Abraham is promised that in the promise to Abraham, that the nations will be blessed. And this is where the author of Hebrews grow, goes, to say, look, God made a promise. And he didn't just make a promise to the people of this world, but he made a promise that he then ratified by a covenant or by an oath. He sealed it. He made it contractual so that it was sealed, so that it's assured that these promises that the Lord made to Abraham will come true, so that we can have great confidence in him. So that we go on in Hebrews 6.15, and we hear this, then Abraham waited patiently, and he received what God had promised. He received what God had promised. Now wait, did he receive what God had promised? In a sense, he did. What he received was a son. He received a son. In their old age, Sarah gave birth to a son. God made good on his promise to them. And that son became the father of the man that we accredit the name Israel to, for the nation of Israel. And the kingdom of God begins to grow. But Abraham didn't see the fullness of the problem, po promise. Abraham didn't see the Israelites come into the promised land. That won't happen until n nearly a thousand years later. Abraham didn't see the nations be blessed. Spoiler alert, we're only beginning to see the nations be blessed. He didn't get to see the nations be blessed. He didn't see the fullness of the promise. But he believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. And I believe that when Abraham had the birth of his son, that he knew, and in that moment, he knew that the promise would be sure that the promise, the fullness of the promise that was given to Abraham would be sure in the birth of his son so that he could, he, he could have great confidence in God to know that the end would come, that the fullness of the promise would come. Now, again, it was generations before even the promise of multiplication was filled through the nation of Israel. It's estimated that when the Israelites were sojourning, a lot of your Bibles say, they were living in the land of Gad, which was in Egypt. Um, uh, land of Goshen, which was in Egypt. That was weird. And uh, uh, they're living in the land of Goshen, which is in Egypt. And uh, you've probably heard or seen the story of the Exodus, or you've read it in your scriptures. And God 
takes them out of Egypt and he sends them towards the promised land through the wilderness. Now, it's estimated that there were approximately 2 million Israelites at that time. That's a lot of multiplication that has happened. But I want to make an observation about that. Can we call that multiplication? We can. Can we call it filling the earth? We cannot. We cannot call it filling the earth. In fact, since the separation of the nations, we can only count this as one nation following the, one, the Almighty, following God. And so this still is not the fullness of the promise. When they go into the promised land, and a detail that you can analyze out of the scriptures, maybe you've heard this before. But we're told the boundaries of the land that the Lord promised to Abraham. And we know that when Joshua brought the Israelites in over the Jordan River and into the promised land, and they began to conquer the different nations and to, and to push the people out, and they began to settle in the land of Israel, that they only ever secured about half of what God promised to Abraham. The, the whole promise of the land didn't come to fruition. And by the way, today, the boundaries of the land of Israel are only a portion of what Joshua took. And this is very interesting because you go, well, what of the promise of the land? What of it? And what, it, what about the king? What about the king? When Israel came into the land and they were being led by uh, they were being led by Joshua, and then Joshua died, and they were being led by the prophet. And they went to the prophet, and they said, Samuel, tell the Lord that we want a king like the other nations have. And the Lord responded that he would give them a king, but only to their detriment, because they would not recognize their God as their king. And he gave them a king, and even in the most righteous kings, like David and Hezekiah, they were still following sinful men who left them, who led them through paths of destruction. And that's the best case scenario because most of the rulers of Israel were wicked men who led them into idolatry, to abandon the name of Yahweh, the one true God, to abandon worship and to bring idols into, into the temple and to follow after the gods of the nation. And so the people, they had no king like God is king. They had no righteous king. And so where is this promise? The question that the author of Hebrews wants us to ask is, so then is God a liar? After 4,000 years where we stand today, 2,000 at the time that the author of Hebrews wrote, from Abraham to Hebrews, is God a liar? Because that's what people were saying. The Israelites themselves would go to their rabbis and say to their rabbis, where is our God? Where is the promise that he has given to Israel? They were, they were living in persecution under Roman rule, barely able to carry out their practices of worship before God, and they're complaining, where is our God? And so the author of Hebrews wants to address this, and we can answer this, ask this today too. Is God a liar then? Because we have not seen the fulfillment of these promises. Well, here's what he says in verse 17 and 18. God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that God would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. In other words, God is not a liar, first of all, because he promised, and not only that he promised, but second of all, that he secured it with an oath, by a covenant. He has chosen not just to promise a blessing to his people, but he's chosen to be in covenant relationship with them, contractual agreement with them. So, so, th so that there's no sense in which they should ever believe that God would not bless them and multiply them and give them peace in the land. And I know sometimes this kingdom stuff seems abstract, but I want you to think about your daily lives. And, and even though we live in the Western world where our greatest pains are rarely threat of life, like other nations are, like other nations are suffering from, we still, we look at our pains, and I just want you, to, want you to reflect on this idea of the kingdom and think, were I in a better kingdom, a holy kingdom, a righteous kingdom, under God, would I, have, would I then have the blessings that we're talking about? You see, a lot of the blessings of God, they really are socio-political blessings. They really do come this way. 
that every, that every pain you have of economics doesn't exist in the eternal kingdom of God. That every, every threat of life and death that comes from, from the political endeavors of wicked men, you do not have that in the eternal kingdom of God. That pain and conflict between humans in society, we do not have that in the eternal kingdom of God. And I, I really think everything boils down to this idea that what one, every one of us desperately searches for this in this life is a restoration, a perfection, to see the kingdom of God present in our life. That's what each of us needs most desperately. And so we look at this and we think, well, that God has promised this restoration, but where is it? And the author of Hebrews assures us he has promised it. He has sealed it by his oath and his covenant with us. And we're then to hold on to it, he says. We're to hold on to it. For the author of Hebrews, the ultimate fulfillment of the promise to Abraham is still a future thing. I, I think this is fantastic. Because, see, the Israelites, they always looked at Abraham as their father. Don't we have Abraham as our father? The Pharisees said to Jesus. They saw Abraham as, the, as their father, the one who all of them as descendants, physical descendants, came out of Abraham. And now the author of Hebrews looks to Abraham, and even knowing that the floodgates have been opened and all the nations are called into God's kingdom, he says, Abraham is our father to the church. I think that's fantastic. I think it's fantastic because, see, the author of Hebrews goes hand in sand, hand with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, looked to, uh, lo the Apostle Paul looked to Abraham, and he said that Abraham walked with the Lord by faith, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and then explains that we, too, become children of Abraham, not because of our genetics, not because of descendancy, not because we share blood and DNA with Abraham, but when we walk by faith, we become children of Abraham. And so this promise, this covenant, is the same covenant that we come into. That everything we're about as the church is to see this fulfillment of the kingdom of God coming that was promised to Abraham and yet still stands as ultimately future for us today. When we reflect on Israel's history and we ask where did they fall short, it's when they went to Samuel and they asked him to petition the Lord for a king. Because the kings of the nation of Israel were, were, were always imperfect and always and often sinful, often wicked men. And they read, led Israel in the wrong direction. And what's fantastic about that is that the Lord wanted them to follow him as king. He wanted to speak through his prophet and, to the, and, and for them to submit to God as king and not to have a human king. And yet, as we look to Palm Sunday, we're going to see that the Lord has now given us a human king. But not a human king like the rulers of Israel in times past. But a human king that is also God as king. And you already know his name because his name is Jesus. So we're going to go to the story of Palm Sunday out of Matthew chapter 21. I'm going to read it to you. And I want you in light of this kingship idea to read this passage with me. So here's what it says. So Jesus is a week before um, his resurrection. He's five days before his crucifixion. And as Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. In other words, they're in a town right outside Jerusalem. Okay, Jerusalem is where uh, the palace of David used to be, and it's where the temple is. Um, in Jerusalem, right? And so they're coming to Jerusalem, and Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead, saying, go into the village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied up with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. Now, if anyone asks you what you're doing, just say the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. So here we go. This is what, this took place 
to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Okay, okay, let's pause in the passage. We're going to go all the way through verse 9, but let's reflect on, on this. Who did they believe that Jesus was? Who did the people believe that Jesus was? Well, his disciples believed that he was king. That he was king. When Jesus was crucified, what was the placard that was put on the cross? King of the Jews. Jesus, Jesus was seen as king. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought, brought the donkey and the colt to him, and they threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Now most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and all the people around them were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. See, Jesus was in the center of the procession. And what that, well, that means two things. First of all, there was a procession, uh, which we sometimes would call a parade. And most parades in the ancient world were for about the same reason. They had something to do with the king coming into the city. Most of the time, the king was coming into the city because he had gone off to battle and he was coming back victorious. And so if you were a victorious king and you were coming back from a battle with good news for your people, you would stop outside the city and all of your advisors would, would, uh, would, would get people together and they would get them into a procession and they would elevate the king high on his throne and they would put him in the center of the procession so that, so that, you know, so, so that the beginning and the end of the parade aren't as exciting, but then you get the king and the king might be throwing coins or, or something out to the people to show what a great king he is. And then they would send messengers down into the city because virtually every ancient city was built the same way the palace is in the middle and there's one main road very wide road a lot of the roads are just little paths that you can barely walk through but there's one wide road going from the city gates all the way up to the temple and that's where all the marketplaces are because it's the biggest road it's where people are buying and selling things and so and so there's this mi main road and they send people in the, to the city and they say the king is coming and so then people from all over, the t all over the city, they come to that main street to watch the procession, to watch the parade. And so this is what Jesus does. He, he forms this parade in order to demonstrate that the king of Jerusalem has come. Now, th it's not just him, because then the people of the city, they recognize him as king. Do you see what they do? They start to lay palm branches out and to lay their cloaks down in the streets so that as Jesus and the disciples come into the city, they're walking on the sort of, we would call it a red carpet, but this is the entire idea that they've laid in the street. They're not work walking in, in, in the waste of animals and the mud and stuff that's in the streets. No, they're walking, they're walking on the clean, dry ground from the, from the branches and from the cloaks of the people. They're being elevated as being royalty. And this is at the hands of the people. And what do they call him? Well, they call him the son of David. They're recognizing his descendancy from the king. And what do we call the son of a king? A prince, until the king dies, and then he's the king. And this is the, this is the point, that they call him the son of David because they're recognizing his right to be king of the, to be king of the Hebrews, to be king of the Jewish people. They say, blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. All kings in the ancient world believed that they were, were at, at least blessed by the gods and frequently that they were influenced or indwelled by the gods or sometimes that they are in fact gods themselves. And here they, they're recognizing that David, I'm sorry, that Jesus, the son of David, is the king and not the king by his own right but the king by the calling of the Lord God Almighty. Where did stuff go south where five days later they're hanging him on a cross? Because this is who they believed he was when he came into the city, and they praised God in the highest heaven. 
what's interesting, I'm, I mean, I can get into it for a moment now. Most of the Israelites, by, by the day of the crucifixion, have now turned on Jesus. Okay, the rulers of the the rulers of Israel of the religious the religious rulers. They, they sought to have Jesus killed. They brought him before uh, their own authorities and before the Roman authorities. The people rejected Jesus. But what's interesting is there's refugees among them. I'll tell you why I use that, that word. Hebrews 6.18 said, We who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence. They're recognizing that Jesus is king, whether anybody in Israel was willing to believe in him as king. They're still going to recognize him as king. And they're still going to say that if you're un- in this world and you're suffering, suffering, as all people are to some degree in all times, you are suffering from, from living in this world under the kings of this world. Then there is a greater king, and his name is Jesus. And he has opened the borders of the kingdom of God for you to flee from this world, to no longer be allegiant to the kings of this world, but to give your loyalty to him, to be refugees. Isn't that what refugees are? Those who seek refuge in him. He's called us to be refugees in the kingdom of God, to not be, to not be hoping that somehow the United States is going, going to go in and fix some sort of political issue in this world so our gas prices go down. It's a bigger problem. It's a bigger problem. It's a problem of sin and wickedness of the heart of the men and women who lead the countries and the nations of this world. And it doesn't matter, even if we had Christian leaders in key positions, they are still sinful people. There is no king like God is king. And there is no king but Christ himself. And so we flee to him for refuge. refuge. There are refugees who are the people of the kingdom of God. And so we look around in our communities and we think, well, where is is God among us? And he's right here. And he's, you know, across town in any number of other churches through his people. Everywhere that his people are gathered today, there is the kingdom of God. There is the kingdom of God. Hebrews 6, 19 This hope leads us into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest. 8, 1, 2. This is my main point, the author of Hebrews writes. We have a high priest who has sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. See, Jesus was crucified on Friday, but he rose on Sunday. And then he ascended to the right hand of the Father. Where we're told in Daniel 7 that when the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days, he was given all authority and all dominion. And the Apostle Paul reflects on this situation. And the Apostle Paul says that when Jesus was died, he was then exalted to the right hand of the Father, where all authority in heaven on earth was given to him, so that every knee in heaven on earth would bow at the name of Jesus. You see, Paul Paul looked back and said, Jesus is king, and he is on the throne now. Daniel looked forward prophetically, and he said, the Son of Man is coming and will be seated on the throne, where he will have all authority. And all of our struggles come down to authority. And you have the highest king, who is the perfect king, who is the righteous king, and he is on the throne. Hebrews 8, 6, now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood, for he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. And this is the gospel for you. This is the gospel for you. Sometimes when I talk about the kingdom and then I say this is the gospel, people go, that's not the gospel. But it is the gospel. Sometimes we think we believe that the gospel is merely that Jesus died in order to Pay for the debt that we have for our sins. And that's true, that that is the gospel. But Jesus didn't die so that as individuals, God could forgive us for our sins. Jesus died so that as individuals, you would be forgiven for your sins and then enter into the covenant that God has made with his people 
in the kingdom of God so that you would abandon loyalty to the kingdoms of this world and that you would be faithful to Jesus and his kingdom. That's the gospel. The gospel is that God is creating a kingdom for his glory and that he has sent his son to die for your war crimes, if you will, so that you can enter into his kingdom, so that you can be the people and he can be the king. And as I read the book of Revelation, the coming of the new earth and the new heaven will be your land. And so this is the gospel. It's the promise of a perfect kingdom. It's the promise given to Abraham that his descendants will be many, that they will be countless, and that we will come into the perfect land. And I just want you to take hold of that hope today. I want you to leave here today at peace with unrest in this world. I want you to be at peace even when there is no peace in this world. I want you as a Christian to know that you have a higher king of greater authority, a king who is king of kings, a Lord who is Lord of lords, a God who is God of gods, so that, so that you don't have an anxiety in this life, so that nothing in this life is seen as significant in light of the promise that was given to Abraham and further which has been given to you. That there is a glorious king who rules a glorious kingdom and that that kingdom is yours. And that kingdom is yours as you believe God. It is counted to you as righteousness and you become one of his people. These promises are better promises. Better than Abraham could have ever imagined. And they're for Abraham, but they are also for you. Enter into his kingdom today. Let me pray for you. Lord, we come before you thankful for really the theology of the people of Jerusalem in Jesus' day. That they saw Jesus coming into, the, into Jerusalem and they praised him as the anointed king of Israel. And I want to thank you, Lord, also for those who were faithful to Jesus, even through his death. That, that, they, had, they, were, that they had a bigger vision. That they were willing to be faithful that they were willing to persevere as Abraham persevered and to wait on the promises. Lord, I pray that you would give us that perseverance. That though we live in this world full of imperfect kingdoms, I pray that you would give us the ability to persevere in faithfulness to you as we set our eyes on the perfection of the eternal kingdom that is to come. And Lord, we pray that it would come, and we pray come quickly. Lord, we thank you so much that you sent Jesus to bring us back into right relationship to you that we wouldn't be abandoned to the wickedness of this world but that we could become righteous as abraham was righteous that we can be forgiven by the blood of jesus and that we can be in your kingdom forever we pray this in jesus name amen